Everyone, please welcome to Google, Ben Ratliff. Hi. Hi. And Ben. Thank you. Uh, so just to get started, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your history with music criticism, how you got started in uh, reviewing music in your career. I grew up in a family uh, of non-musicians. Um, but for one reason or another, I was always oriented toward listening closely to music. I don't know why, but, uh, but, I, but I was. And it, it just started with whatever was at hand, whatever records we had in the, in the house. Um, I, was, I was also a musician, and I started to play along with things, and that was fun, too. And that, and that was that was important because then I could actually enter the music and find a place to figure out how I can actually get into the space of it, which has been a recurring um, question for me, you know, as a, as a writer. Um, how, do, how can I do it and how can we all do it? And then, um, you know, at a certain point, somebody handed me a jazz record when I was a teenager, a Miles Davis record, a family friend said, I think you might like this. And um, that started a long interest in jazz. I went to a, a, a university that had a great radio station. And, um, and going to the radio station, that had a, which had a great collection of, this was in 1985 when I started college. And they had a, a, a really, big collection of records, particularly jazz records. And that was my first experience of the internet. Actually, I like to ask people, you know, what, what, was, what, was your first what was your first experience of the internet before there was an internet? You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, sure. Of the social internet. Yeah, yeah. well, of the idea of, of um, the idea of muchness the idea of everythingness mm -hmm. before there was an internet, you know? So here, here was the great matrix. Here was the great body of knowledge. And what do, so where do I start? I just start with what I know. Mm -hmm. So I, I found my way to what I knew, those the records that I knew. And then I thought, okay, well, what led to this? You know, I know this one record by John Coltrane what created this record? What led to this record? And that, and you know, you, so then you go backwards, and that. So I learned a lot about music that way, and also I, I was a writer and thought of myself as a writer, and so it just sort of became inevitable that I'd be writing about music. Uh huh. Great. Um, so you sort of talked about the way that you, you're always finding new ways to listen to music and get into music, and one of the premises of this book is that. A lot of the ways that we typically think about listening to music don't suit us very well in this age of the cloud where we have infinite access to all music at all times. So what are the ways that, that you feel people typically listen to music or the framework that they think about music in? Well, um, this is anecdotal, but um, I, I do find that in the, in the 10 years since, let's say in the 10 years since Spotify, and, and in the, the greater amount of time since, uh, you know, getting music easily or for free or whatever from, from the internet has become a normal practice in life. I find that, you know, a lot of people are faced with a choice. They might not even know that it's a choice, but it is a choice. And it's, the, the choice is either a kind of like um, bottomless, I guess like an infinite shallowness or, or a bottomless comfort zone. Because what you, you, you know, by the time you become a, a kind of engaged listener or, you know, somebody who likes music, you sort of, you have an idea of what it is that you like. And what the internet offers you is the possibility of being able to listen to a, a larger circle of what it is that you like forever until you die. And um, 
it's not, it's not as narrow as it used to be. It's much larger, but it's basically related to what you already, to, to your, your self-definition mm -hmm. as a listener. Or you can do something else, which is to be a little, to be more active and to, and to think of um, what, all that you have access to. We have access to, it's not everything. In fact, it's not everything. Mm -hmm. Not even close, but, it, but, it, but it's, there's so much of it that it can feel like everything. And so, so, so what are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna access what we don't know? How are we gonna walk toward what we don't know? Which to me feels like um, the challenge, I guess, but also the gift. Um, I, because I, because I, I lived half my life before the internet, before the internet became popularly used, mm -hmm. I guess I still think in terms of libraries, of physical libraries. And so, like, that's, that's my metaphor. It's hard to shake it. And so, um, often, in the, in the, in the conversations that I often have with people about music today, what do you like? What do you listen to? How do you, how do you find new music? Um, the word uh, overwhelmed comes up often. And um, so often that in fact it's become a kind of cliche. Like people just don't even know how to express their feeling and they reach for that word, overwhelmed. And um, so then I think, okay, well so, that's funny because let's say you walk into a really fa fantastic library, you know, like a great institutional library, the New York Public Library, or the one up at Columbia, or the one down at NYU. When you go in there, especially if you can sort of like get a sense of the stacks and see, you know have a sense of how big it is, is the first thing you think, oh, you know, oh, overwhelmed, like. I'll never have time to read all this shit, <laughs> you know? Or do you, or do you think something on the order of, wow, you know, it kind of makes me feel good that um, there's been all, that there's been all this human thought. And I wonder how I can um, start from what I know and find reasons to, to, to get back into those other rooms, those other shelves that as of yet, I have no reason to go to. Yeah, um, so I, I wrote down some of the examples of, uh, so the, the book is a series of essays, I should say, about some of these different methods to try to unlock some of the aspects uh, of music. I wrote down examples of some of the chapters, things like repetition, uh, slowness, speed, to sadness or intimacy. So there's sort of this wide range of different ways that you talk about being able to listen to music. Uh, when you were thinking about this book, how did you come up with those different ways? Are these the ways that you discovered that you naturally listen to music? Were there other ways that didn't get included? Where, where did those categories come from? Sure. Um, well, I'll just, I'll just tell you quickly uh, how I, th like, why, why, why this book and sure. what the structure of it and whatever. I started thinking about, um, uh, this is about five years ago, I started thinking about uh, the, the, I mean, I, I was a music critic for a newspaper for the New York Times for, uh, for 20 years. And, um, and I started thinking about the music appreciation movement in this country, which sort of like late 1800s to about 1960, a lot of people sort of like me, you know, often they were, they were newspaper writers would write books for you know the general readership um, that were sort of saying, oh so, you know so so you want to you want to know about music you want to feel you know something about music well here's some keys to figuring it out and often they usually almost always these books were about Western classical music and um, it was about what the composer wanted you to know. Mm. Um, you know, this is what this is what rhythm is. This is what harmony is. This is what melody is, and then on and on toward um, this is so sonata form. This is what an oratorio is, whatever. And I was thinking, 
and there are many books like this. And I was thinking, well, what would that look like now? What would a book like that look like now? First of all, it wouldn't start with, it, it wouldn't be all about European classical music because we know now that as rich as that tradition is, it's not everything. <laughs> it's one of many possible things that we can listen to. And also the big thing that's changed is that listeners have become so much more powerful in a way because of our access. Access is power. Um, so I thought, well, it'd be interesting to write a book that was much more from the listener point of view rather than from the composer point of view. So at the same time, I was listening to a James Brown record a lot called Ain't It Funky? And um, there's a seven minute song on it called Ain't It Funky? And it's really repetitious. And the repetition of it is what's great about it. And um, I mean, repetition is just such an interesting subject and plenty of people have written about it. There are a number of really good songs called repetition. <laughs> Um, and so um, I thought, okay, well, this is a great place to start a book, writing about repetition. So if you write about James Brown's kind of repetition, then it only makes sense to write about Steve Reich's kind of repetition and Sheik's kind of repetition and, um, you know, uh, repetition in sort of more top 40 music, Rihanna or whatever. Yeah, I wrote down one of my favorite examples was in like one paragraph you talk about Benny Goodman's Sing, 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 and also Kesha's We Are Who We Are. It's two yeah. examples of ways to... Well, I guess the other, the, other, the, the stealth argument of the book is um, keep your receptors open. Listen, listen to everything. Um, uh, Perhaps it doesn't work for everybody. I understand that. And perhaps that, um, in fact, for many people, the idea of listening to a playlist where the, tradi the, the musical tradition in that playlist changes radically every five minutes um, might be annoying or disturbing for some listeners. I understand that. But I do, I guess I have a baseline idea that there's a sort of virtue in listening broadly. There's a virtue in keeping your receptors open. There's a virtue in being able to move forward in the world with what you know, but be open to things that you do not recognize and, and, and start asking the question, and listen to it and ask the question, what's my way in, you know? How can I make use of this, and how can I um, feel that it is also about me? Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a person who's sort of interested in gaining that broad, you want to broaden your musical uh, yeah. listening. I know you don't like the term genre very much, so I'm trying to avoid that specifically. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But if you, if you want to, maybe we'll have to get back to that. Sure. Uh, if you want to broaden those musical uh, uh qualities that you're listening to, and you have access to this seemingly infinite music library, what would you recommend as a, as a first step to start trying to broaden from where you are? Okay, so here's where my talk becomes maybe tricky or it might sound evasive. Um, I, I tried hard not to talk about platforms in this book. In other words, like this, this isn't a book about how to find um, the music that that all the music that might inspire you or enlarge you or whatever it's more about um, suggesting ways of staying open suggesting ways of creating your own little through lines um, for music and I do believe in happenstance and and dumb luck like music is sort of coming at us fr from uh, uh, everywhere now you know um, in shops, in waiting rooms, online, and, and of course, in the streets, you know. Um, uh, we can, especially if we, if we enter a neighborhood that we're not that familiar with, we can usually hear, 
or if we go to a place that we've never been to before, or a city that we don't know that well, or whatever. We can hear music that we've never confronted before. It's easy. It can happen all the time. So then, the, the, so then for instance, there's a, there's a chapter in here about, so repetition is chapter one. The, the, the other chapters, as you said, include, um, there's one about loudness, there's one about quietness, um, and so forth, until by the end of the book, I'm talking about categories that our own, that only I have thought of and are only particular to me. And these are just suggested ways. The point is, I want to give this to readers, and they can take it in any direction they want. But there's, there's for instance, there's a chapter in here about a certain kind of um, repeat, the way sometimes a note is repeated in a piece of music, uh, stubbornly. Not a, not, a, not a structure of repetition, but just like one, a singer or an instrumentalist or whatever, repeating one note over and over and over stubbornly for an effect. Um, uh, rock and roll fans will, will recognize that in the guitar solo in Cinnamon Girl by Neil Young. Like, for some reason in rock and roll, it's a, it's a big thing when it's done. Cinnamon Girl is known as the, that's the song where, where, where the guy plays a solo and it's just one note over and over. Isn't that weird? And it is kind of weird and it's great. But um, in other kinds of music, it's really common. It's really routine. In Afro-Latin music, it's just normal. Um, in, in, uh, more and more in hip hop, it's kind of normal. Uh, what people may be, uh, described pejoratively as like monotone rap. Mm. That's a device, that's an effect. And often the rappers aren't just hitting the same exact note over and over, but a very general area around a note, you know? And so, so then the, so the point is we can all encounter examples of this wh wherever we go and, and think about music in that way. And by doing so, genre sort of, the idea of genre sort of goes out the window. And I find that freeing, or at least it creates a possibility for knowing about more rather than knowing about less. Sure. So, so now that you've sort of formalized, in a sense, these different categories in this book, do you find that it's affected that the way when you start listening to a new album or go to a concert, yeah. is it affecting the way that you're listening to music? Or Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, because as a critic, I think what I always did was I would listen to a piece of music and think, okay, so what is the essential thing going on here? And if such that if you took that essential bit out, it just wouldn't be as special, or the whole thing would sort of fall apart. You know, what is the essential thing? Whether it's a certain kind of technique, or a certain kind of mood, or a certain kind of structure, or whatever. What is that thing that makes this piece of music extraordinary? And um, just to give you an example, uh, right now, um, you know, I, I, read, I read the New York Times every morning, I'm a subscriber and I read the print version because I like the idea that by scanning across the pages, I'm going to encounter something that I, d that I don't know about by happenstance. I like that. And um, uh, over the past you know, few months, every time I read the paper when I'm done, I want to you know, put my head in a toilet. <laughs> I, I really feel um, uh, hopeless. And so, um, but I've been listening to a record now, these days, and I realize this is the record that makes me want to take my head out of the toilet. And it's, it's called Coltrane Plays the Blues. It's a, it's a record by John Coltrane, the jazz saxophonist. It's not like one of his most famous records. Uh, it's from 1960 about. Every track uses the blues form, blues structure, but they're original uh, blues, uh, all I think all written by Coltrane. And um, <sighs> why do I like it? What, what is the essential thing about it? It's because this record expresses certainty 
it, it, it is completely present. Absol- these, there are these four people in a band making music in a room, and you know, you feel the dimensions of that room because um, sometimes Coltrane moves his saxophone away from the microphone, and you, 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 you feel a sense of space where they're making the, the music. Um, you feel a sense of urgency in what they're doing, and also a sense of the long game. Um, there's uh, urgency and wisdom. Like, um, like they're going to put everything they have into this moment and be fully present, and yet they are, they are able to see rather far into the future. And that's, what I, that's how I want to feel right now. <laughs> I want to see beyond what's going on right now. I want to be able to see beyond that. And I want to feel urgent and present and alive. So that's what I'm listening for at the moment. I'm listening for that feeling specifically uh, as I you know, move through life. That could be chapter number 21. Hmm. It feels like we kind of just watched you construct a review for Coltrane Plays the Blues up here on stage. <laughs> is this sort of the, as you're thinking of writing a piece of criticism or a review, is that sort of the process you go through of listening, finding that thing, and translating it to the page? Yes. Um, I tr- yes, I do. I try to find the one essential thing that, for me, makes something special. Uh, and then really bear down hard on it and describe it, really describe it as, as well as I can, um, almost in a ritual sense, which uh, sort of mirrors the ritual going on in the music and, and honors it. Um, yes, and so if I can find the, 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 the that if I can put my finger on that one essential thing in the music that makes it powerful, special, whatever, describe it well, in a, you know, and really get going, then in the best sense, in the best possible situation, something of the essence of that music can actually sort of rise up out of the text. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. I know it sounds mystical, but... Um, you know, otherwise you're just you're just writing about you're just describing music, or you're evaluating something, thumbs up or thumbs down, which feels sort of limited to me. Sure. Um, so we're gonna uh, open it up to questions from the audience in just a minute. So if you have a question, we have microphones on either side of the stage. Uh, you can go line up. Uh, before that, kind of off of that question, I'm interested if anyone here in the audience or watching later. Uh, is interested in starting a career in music journalism or music criticism, what would you recommend to to someone who is just starting out? Well, um, there are many more places to write about music now than there were when I started, say, 25 years ago. And that's great. They don't all pay very well or, or at all, but it, when you're starting, you don't need to worry about that. The point is, um, uh, I think it's important to try and figure out, to know, to know the, uh, the identity and character of these different publications or websites or whatever. Try to figure out some that you really identify with, um, that you feel strongly about. And, and if you start to think, I'd really like to see my name there. I, I would be good with that. If I could see my name in there, I'd be really proud of that. Move toward that place. Mm-hmm. It might take several steps and it might take some months or a year, but move toward it. You know, um, Start thinking in terms of what kinds of writing do they, do they use? What kinds of writing can they use? What kinds of writing do they want? Start writing that way. Um, that's how to get involved. And then from there, you can, you can go in whatever direction you want. Go straight to the New York Times. Straight, yeah. Uh, so we have some questions from the audience. 
Yeah, hi. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious that the internet has changed the music industry, um, but given that you've been following music both before and after the internet, do you think the internet has changed music itself, and, uh, and if so, how? Yeah, I do. Um, I think in a way that um, punk was a funny forecast of, of internet era music because the whole point was to, to, to do it cheaply. You know, there was like an ethic of doing it cheaply and a, and a value of doing it cheaply. And now, of course, like everybody's making music on their own because we've, because we've got the, the tools. It's very, it's very easy to make a good record in your, in your room. Um, and uh, I suppose... There's, so there's the, there's the ease of it, which means there's a whole lot more music appearing. And also, um, I do think that um, there's a certain flattening of the hierarchy of um, influences. Um, uh, in the old days, um, there were certain, if you were a certain kind of uh, songwriter or musician, um, there were, I'm trying to think of, of, of concrete examples so this doesn't sound so abstract, but um, for instance, if you were a jazz musician in, in the 80s, um, it was very important for you to know about um, Coltrane and Miles Davis and Charlie Parker but probably not so important for you to know about um, Sidney Bechet and you know what happened before the '40s, and not so important for you to know about um, free improvisation, because that stuff just wasn't quite as easy to come by. It wasn't quite as plentiful and easy to come by. But now, you know, the internet made everything equally accessible. So that so that became the big change. Um, you, you found greater numbers of g many, many more kinds of influences on each individual artist um, and, and used in unexpected ways. And, it, you know, at, at, in the 90s, it, it, was, it still felt unusual to hear like a Timbaland production and to hear startling sounds in it that came from a totally different musical tradition. Um, it was still startling to hear a DJ mix um, that might move from, um, you know, current hip hop to um, uh, Jamaican dance hall to some kind of 20th century classical music, whatever. Now it's almost expected. It's so easy to do. Um, so those are some of the changes, I think. That, yeah. Hey, hey. Uh, so in your Coltrane example, you talked about Coltrane walking away from the mic and it changes the sound. Do you ever go into a song and listen to a song or music piece from the standpoint of the recording engineering? Like that changes everything, right? Like we've gone from this analog technology where you get these warm, distorted pieces to this digital technology where that's replicated or not quite the same. And th so mm -hmm. one of the things we've kind of lost in this transition to digital, perhaps, are really good liner notes. And you don't always see who the recording engineer was, but you give a musician the same room and the same instruments, but a different recording engineer. And it's going to have a different sound. Yeah. So how often do you go into looking at music from the set, the recorded sound? More and more, yeah. actually. Um, um, uh, yeah, it makes a difference. The engineer slash producer, those roles are, are um, sometimes interchangeable. They're sometimes the same thing. Um, uh, yeah, it makes a big difference. I mean, a, a piece of recorded music isn't just a um, a reference. It isn't just a uh, I don't know um, 
doc, a, 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 a document of something that happened in a certain time in a certain place. It's, um, it's, a, it's evidence of, of, of a physical space. And, um, well, especially when, when live, when live uh, instrumentalists or when live musicians are involved. But even in, even in electronic music, a, a physical space can be suggested. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a uh, I mean, I'm just saying yes, yes, yes. But um, yeah, engin the work of engineers and producers uh, has very much to do with this, I think. Of uh, the, the suggestion of music as a as a physical space. So, in the answer to your to the previous question, yeah, uh, you referenced the punk movement and doing it cheaply, but yeah, um, more and more people are working at home now. Yeah, and you find many great musicians are really poor engineers. Right, so uh -huh. we've gone from these big halls, Abbey Road, yeah. real world studios, to people making music in their bedrooms. How do you think that has affected, you know, uh, the recorded medium that we hear nowadays? Um, I don't think that it's made us worse listeners. I have great faith in listeners. Um, I have great faith in listeners' ability to accept music either as just a, a certain document of what, you know, the simple thing, a certain document of what a musician is doing at a certain place in time versus something bigger, something that does suggest something greater, an environment, uh, uh, a moment in history, uh, uh, whatever. Um, uh, there's so much variation in what can happen. Um, um, so, I, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I really loved what you were saying about getting outside of our music comfort zone. Yeah. Um, and sort of walking the streets in new neighborhoods. Um, yet I feel this like undeniable gravitational pull to my headphones at all times. Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like part of it's that we sit in an open office culture and so just to concentrate. Um, but I find myself even sometimes just, it's, it's like I reach for it before I even think twice. And I just love to know your thoughts on when headphones are a good thing, when headphone, when we should, you know, second guess our headphones and just know your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a subject that I've never really dealt with in writing that much. Um, and I think because I'm afraid of, of leaning toward the, the automatic response of take your headphones out of your ears, you know, um, <laughs> listen to what's going on around you. Um, because that, that, that seems manifestly, uh, you know, it's almost a truism um, that, you know, taking your headphones out of your ears is a good thing. Um, it increases your, your spatial awareness. It, it, it clues you into how other, how other people are talking. Um, it makes you more sensitive to the world around you, etc. cetera. Um, but I use headphones a lot. Um, and why is that? Uh, because I like the sustained experience of immersion in, in music. Um, and uh, we all listen to music more, I think, than we used to. There's a, um, there was a, a, there was a poll two years ago. I think it was a Nielsen poll, and I think some somebody like another uh, polling group or research group called Edison something also did the same kind of poll, and they both came up with the same basic answer, which is that most Americans listen to music for four hours a day, and that's really a lot. Um, and I imagine that a lot, of, a lot of that is probably done on headphones. And um, yeah, well, we l do live more individualized lives. We are more in tune with our, the, our, our in particular streams of information or culture. I suppose it's, I suppose it's, how we're it's part of how we're surviving. Uh, it could be that. Um. You think about the sort of social versus solo 
as a platform for listening? I haven't read your book yet, but I absolutely will now. Um, is that something that you discuss? And, and, you know, headphones playing a role in that so, you know, solo versus social experience listening to music. It is not something I discuss in the book, and I'd really like to, I'd really like to discuss it at some point in the future, because it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. I mean, in the, if you think about what music is, is for originally, you know, like way, way, way back, it's something that was done, you know, with people. I mean, either you were making music with other people or, or, it, was a, or it had something to do with the church or, or uh, whatever. Um, so the experience of music totally solo, which is just so common, it is, a, is a new thing. I do it every day, um, but I, I don't talk about platforms in the book, but I will say that, that, that um, the, the, my current sort of filter, the thing that I trust more than anything else to, to, do, to deliver music to me is not an algorithm, but an internet radio station called NTS that's, uh, that's based in London. And to me, it is sort of like my dream of, um, of musical breadth um, with very little uh, uh, sense of uh, a corporate entity trying to say, you know, we're this radio station. We're the kind of radio station that gives you this. Listen to us. There's very little of that. It's, there's no commercials. There's no nothing. It's just, you know, 24-7 DJs who really know what they're doing and presenting all kinds of different music. So I listen to that every morning for an hour and, uh, and I'm good, but I do that with headphones. So it's a very Im Im immersive experience. That seems to be what I want. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I got a little bit of light to this talk, so I don't know if you already touched this, so apologies if you did. Um, so I find myself uh, listening to a lot of uh, like music from like 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s. Um, and as you were saying earlier, um, you know, when I look at uh, the album of the year of um, of like Enemy, Pitchfork, like any publication, I'm really, I get really sad. Like I try to give it a go and it doesn't really work out. Um, mm -hmm. So it just seems like I'm not really into like uh, music that people are making these days or mm -hmm. not so much. Yeah. Um, and uh, so my question to you is, do you feel like um, uh, like music distribution platforms like uh, Spotify, Google Play Music, do you feel like that they devalue music? Interesting. So you're saying that music from the 60s was better than music now. Yeah. And, and, that, and, that, and that part of what has led to that problem is yeah, Spotify. There's, there's like a paradigmatic example is that, for example, um, like the other day I was, uh, I was, uh, I had never listened to it, but I started uh, listening to an album from like Black Sabbath. Uh, which, which one? Is, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, Master... Uh, Master of Reality. Yes, Master of Reality, because I got like this last song and I was like, oh yeah, this is really cool stuff. And I could see myself like before music was like, was so easy with like, before it was so easy for me to like just open Spotify and hit play and it was playing for me. Yeah. Like even in the times of Napster, I, I would have to go, actually go have the effort to download the album mm -hmm. and it would be just sitting there and I could just open the folder. So I had to go through that. Um, and But what happens now is that I go, I give it a few plays, I listen to the record for, I don't know, not even a week maybe. Uh, and I'm already I'm already done with it, oh. and I and I just go fast forward. Whereas before, I I think I would just maybe so I don't know, ruminate a little bit more. You're suggesting that it's not even the music's fault. Yes. Okay. Hence my question: Like, do you think that the platforms uh, devalue music? Like, do they do you, do you think that because it's so easy to reach? Uh, that you know, artists will slack off, or like they, it will be so easy for people to listen to other artists, so they would just won't put as much effort into making like nice melodies. I think it can devalue. The, uh, there can be some devaluing going on. Yes. Um, to okay, uh, 
you, you know, when I was a teenager, I would have to go great distances to find a certain kind of record. And the, the, and the journey that I took to do it, whether it was like bicycling or taking a bus or going to another city or like asking somebody to mail me a copy or whatever, all that, the effort expended seemingly to me added value to the music once it, once it finally arrived and I, and I put it on the thing and, you know, and, and that created more value, sure. Um, uh, a, f a colleague of mine once said to me, and I, I think I was, I think I was telling this colleague that same exact story or whatever, and he said, "Oh, so so then you'd rather go get water from a well every day, like you know, drag it all the way into your house, maybe several times a day." <laughs> Other than you'd you prefer that than just turning on the tap, and uh, no, I wouldn't prefer. I would prefer to turn on the tap. <laughs> I, I think that as as long as you are aware of how easy it is, as long as you really are aware of how easy it is to to just press one button and immediately you've got you know beach house whatever, um, then that helps. Um, But there's another question. It sounds like you're saying that music from before had more value. Uh, to me, it did. To me, like if I uh, like the other time I saw like a picture where it had like um, like the lyrics from a Led, Le uh, Led Zeppelin song uh, compared to like lyrics from like a, I don't know like a, nowadays in the artist I couldn't remember who he was. But and like the, the 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 Led Zeppelin ones were like so ordinated, so like it was so masterfully crafted. Like Steely Dan, I was look, listening to it the other day, and just the, the, the such good tunes that you could see that they had been worked and reworked and reworked. And I don't see anyone doing that nowadays. I don't know if it's because it plays less, it's not as rewarding. I don't know if it's because people are just not into that anymore. Yeah. I'm kind of trying to look for an answer to why I like the stuff that stuff before and it's mm. just nowadays nothing really moves me like I'm not convinced by that argument I mean I do I do think that there's a lot there's a lot of new music that that um, that is every bit as exciting as music that was made in the 60s and 70s some sometimes um, the you know what is new about it is often the question and I sometimes the ways that it is new are just they're smaller ways um, but uh, I think that the Solange record is, is particularly good. I think the new record by Cass McCombs is particularly good. Um, I think that uh, there's, uh, there's, there's plenty of people making music that has lots of mm, stuff going on, lots of thought, lots of... Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe then another question would be why is it not that mainstream? But maybe I think someone else wants to make questions, so I'll probably cut it here. <laughs> but thanks. Sure. There is another um, there is another way of thinking about it too. There's a there's a writer named Mark Fisher who died last month, and um, and he was a a British Marxist. Uh, um, sort of cyberpunk influenced. Uh, academic, music obsessive writer, and he wrote a lot about music, uh, a lot of it on a blog in the aughts called K-Punk. And um, his theory was that um, that we live in a time where um, uh, there's you know like no more originality; it's all stopped. And the reason for that has to do with he blamed he blamed capitalism. He said that you know it's easier to Mark Fisher said that it's now easier to um, imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. And so, and so he talked about music in a in a sense of with a sense of great loss. You know, like we can't imagine the future. It's hard. It's so much harder now to imagine the future, a future. I don't. 
I'm not nearly that doctrinaire, and I believe that in the way we listen to music now, we are, we are, particip we are still participating in music in lots of different ways. Even when, when we're listening to something on SoundCloud, you know, and you, you know, those, and somebody like will put a little comment in somewhere along the way, and the comment will be like, ooh, or, or, or I love that part right there. This is part of how we interact. And also, of course, going to live performances and taking part, participating in the, in the culture around music. This is all still going on. All this suggests that music has a future and participation has a future. Hi, um, I'm curious about your ideas on the validity of not liking something. Like as a um, music critic or yeah, just yeah. as a consumer, sure. what happens when you just listen to something and you don't like it? Do you think it's like on your part to try harder to mm -hmm. like it? Or do sure. you think maybe at some point you can just give up and be like, I just don't like it? Yep, you can give up. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you can give up. But, as, but, but, um, but I think that, uh, but if you can be specific about why you're giving up, and maybe if you can uh, accept the possibility that that particular music that you decided is no good, that particular recording, song, artist, whatever, may come from a tradition that has things that, you know, that will be really meaningful to you, that you, that you might like. I think that's, that's good. Um, what I, I guess what I don't, what I don't like is, is pe when people these days say, I'm the kind of person who, like my blood freezes, you know, I'm the kind of person who just doesn't like such and such. And usually it's a, it's a, big, it's a big thing. It's a big thought. It's a big area. It's, a, it's an entire tradition of music or whatever. I just think, ugh, like what a loss. What a loss, you know. So you don't like this one, you know, techno record. Does that mean that all techno is going to be terrible for you? Probably not. So maintain curiosity is, is all I'm into, but it, it, that's what I'm into. Um, but there's plenty of things that I can't stand. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of curious, like, if you ever had to review an album that maybe everybody likes, but you're just like, I can't stand it. Like, at what point can you just be like, you know, <laughs> just hand it off to somebody else? Yeah. Often I was able to hand it off to somebody else. <laughs> um, and sometimes I had to go through with it. <laughs> And really felt like an like an alien, you know. Mm -hmm. um, why? And, and I can't think of a single example <laughs> of these. But yeah, I, I had definitely had that experience for mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So we've got time for one more question, really quick. Hi. Hi. Um, do you think there's any way? Any? Do you think there's a wrong way to recommend music to people? I think there's a wrong way to recommend music to people. Um, I have kind of a grudge against algorithms. And, and, and here's why. I mean, um, I think that, I think that, I mean, algorithms are going to keep, they, they will exist. They will continue to, to get better and better. Like, they're not going away. So I feel fine in saying that I have a grudge against them. Um, and sometimes they're useful, too, because they will put in front of you a song that you've never heard before. That, that, there's a value to that. The, so, that song is probably related to things you already know and is, and is probably be, being put in front of you so as to make you feel comfortable, comforted even. And um, to me, it feels like, um, well, what I've learned from watching stalker movies and also from having worked at the, as a music critic at the New York Times and, and having worked with, with music publicists is that I don't trust people who, who come to me and say, I know, I know you're going to like this I, because I know about you and I'm, and I'm anticipating your desires. Um, and, and, 
If they love me as a human being and they say that, I, there's nothing better. But if they're saying that um, for, for, uh, prof for professional or financial gain, I don't trust them for a second. So, um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, I guess my advice to people is to, you know, use algorithms, but but know that they're faulty. Know that they're limited. Know that they don't really know what you're going to be thinking tomorrow. They can't. They're predicated entirely on who you were yesterday. And um, and uh, you know to try to imagine um, new things, new ways of listening that you haven't done up to this point. Um, that's you know that's the that's 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 imagining a future. That's what being able to imagine a future is. Thank you. I wish we could stick around and talk about music all day, but we've got to wrap up, unfortunately. Uh, we have every song ever for sale in the back of the room afterwards. Uh, and I'd like to thank Ben once again for coming to Google. Thanks. Thanks. For Thanks, Aaron. <laughs>